Cause I'm on the trail, thought I was eating. On the trail, yeah. On the trail, I can't believe it. On the trail. Hey y'all, welcome to the Coyote Traffic School Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Pope, and my goal is to help you get started trapping and to help you and me become better trappers. If you need trapping supplies, be sure to visit Cots Brothers Lures, K-A-A-T-Z-B-R-O-S dot com. They carry a full line of trapping equipment, baits and lures, as well as instructional books and DVDs. They're great people to deal with, and they'll get you set up right. Now, let's talk trapping. All right, so we're here this evening with Kyle Cotts of Cotts Brothers Lures, and uh, we, Kyle reached out to me, and they have become the uh, our main sponsor on the podcast and uh, YouTube channel, and so I asked Kyle if he would also come on and, and give us an interview and kind of give us a little background of, of Cotts Bros Lures and, you know, where it came from and, and uh, you know, how they got started. It's a pretty interesting uh interesting story so kyle I'll, I'll turn it over to you if you give us kind of a little a little intro and history of of yourself and and Cots bros sure well we uh my brother kellen and i started the business in in 1995 which at the time i was uh 15 and, and kellen was 13 and and uh, we had decided we were going to be lure makers and ordered up some different ingredients and mixed up our first lure on my mom's kitchen table and and uh, <laughs> that uh, she was at work and didn't know about it until long after the fact. But the business basically started at that point, and and we were definitely rather green and inexperienced. And then, you know, here we are uh, going on 25 years later, and kind of uh, in a nutshell had a had a real kind of a roller coaster ride 25 years. But it's been a lot of fun, and we kind of learned a lot, I guess. Uh, over the course of that time, but uh, that's kind of how it all started, uh, just with with making lure. And I was, I wrote a column in the Fur Taker magazine called "For Kids of All Ages," and um, just started started meeting different people and and making contacts. And you know, at that point, it was pre-internet, so you know, my dad would drive us to some conventions, and and then as I got my license, I mean, I, I hit the road really hard, and and. Uh, it was, it was a different era then, and it wasn't really that long ago. But uh, it's it's kind of kind of fun to look back on, really. So what do you what do you mean by it was a different era then? Um, well, like now I would say most people that buy from us order on their phone on our website. And okay. in '95, when I was first starting, I didn't even. I didn't even know what the internet was yet. <laughs> sure, sure. And then about 98, 97, 98, I, got, I graduated high school early, and, and 97, 98, uh, when I first started going to conventions, there were no websites in the trapping business. Um, so to go from that to where we are now, um, you know, that's that's what I mean. I, I, I think the whole way that we interact with the customer in the trapping business has totally changed. And in 1998, I would have never dreamed that I could uh, uh, communicate with people and buy things on my telephone. <laughs> I don't even. Think, I, I I had a I had a cell phone then, but it was it was very uh, very much different than what the cell what the cell phone is now. <laughs> sure. So that's it's, that's pretty interesting to me. And I think there's a lot of especially the younger folks that really get enthralled in trapping and and you know sit around thinking about how to to make trapping you know a main a part of your life really not just during the season but you know build a business around it and y'all i mean y'all started out started out grew up trapping and 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 then did just that at a really young age what what was the what was the reception when you when y'all would go and set up a booth at a at a convention what was the reception to a couple of young teenagers selling bait and lure (laughs) <laughs> that's a great question it brings back a lot we could probably do a whole hour podcast just about that question <laughs> but um, it's, it's interesting and it taught me a lot um, I, I'm sure you've heard the saying people say it's not what you know but it's who you know Sure. and going back to those days 
I met some key people, and the one person that comes to mind is Keith Winkler. Keith is the owner of Sterling Fur Company, and Keith, at that time and, and even now, Sterling Fur is, is one of the largest wholesalers. They they supply a lot of dealers in the industry with different items, um, but uh, Keith was one of the first people we met um, in about 1997 at a fur takers convention in LaGrange, Indiana. Keith come over to our booth. Kellen and I had a few lures, and we had ordered our bottles and stuff from Keith, just retail, out of the retail catalog. And uh, we set up at the convention. We, we had some used traps we had bought from a local trapper that was getting out of trapping and retiring. So we were selling used traps and had a few lures, and Keith came over and said, hey, I saw you guys ordered like 100 lure bottles or something, and, and I wanted to give you our wholesale catalog. And Keith, at, at, you know, uh, at, at that stage being like 16, 15, 16 years old, Keith treated me the same then as he does now. And I've always, uh, I've always thought about that as we deal with, with younger people that, you know, age is irrelevant. Um, you should treat uh, a, a customer or a business associate the same whether they're 15, 50, or 75, you know, age is just a number. And I, I look back, and people like Keith Winkler, Gerald Schmidt, Tim Taven, they treated me the same when I was 15 years old as they do now. And um, they they would do anything to help me succeed. And as time went on, I've gotten to know, you know, I've, there's quite a few people I can think of that 25 years later I still do business with. I consider them friends, ate dinner with, some I've trapped with, and, and and it's it's interesting to me that a lot of the people when I was 15 that said, oh, that kid, he's too young to have these experiences, or he's too young to, you know, you're too young, you don't know what you're doing. The people that made them comments are not in business anymore. Right. Um, they, are, they are long since gone. And so I, I think that was something at the time I didn't know about when I look back, um, how people treated me I, it's such a great learning lesson I think as a whole um, you know to people that were open minded to a youngster um, you know I still do business with them today and the ones that were are gone um, so I think that's important to, uh, to uh, I guess looking back it's taught me now to, to keep an open mind um, when you're doing business and, and just in, in, in life also, that you know, if you're if you're open-minded and and kind of kind of uh, try to step back and and not react too quickly, that that you really learn a lot and and you make good friends and and you often in business make money because you you kind of you kind of let something unfold more or less and and reserve your judgments. Um, so that was that's a good question. I mean, I it's hard now. Um, for me to sometimes remember how, I, let me rephrase that, looking back, I forget sometimes how hard it was to kind of build the business because, like I say, at that point, I basically had to get in my truck and drive to New York or Nebraska or, or you know, a, a million other places to go to conventions to really reach trappers um, or I would advertise in the magazines, but that was kind of hit or miss because I didn't really have a, a brand identity at that point. Whereas, you know, now if a, if a 15-year-old kid wanted to just start into the trapping business, you could do it through social media, you could do it online. It saved a lot of the legwork, really. Um, so I, I look at it from that perspective. It's like, man, I was kind of at a disadvantage because <laughs> I, I'm – blew up a few transmissions trying to trying to sell a four dollar or at the time three dollar bottle of lure <laughs> yeah that's that's really interesting you say that and I, I that was kind of i wanted to i wanted to get to you know after kind of listening to some of your other podcasts with with jeremiah wood on trapping today and uh you know just just hearing y'all story and how you how you grew the business as, as two young kids and you know is do you would you consider that still possible today for a 15 year old in 2019 that has a passion for trap and that that wants to tinker around with lures? I mean, could they could they in 25 years look back on a on a successful trap and supply business and and uh, 
I guess just that, be able to look back on a on a successful supply business. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's totally possible. Um, I'm I'm very much an optimist, and and there's a a, a great a great quote. Uh, I, I want to say say it's Einstein that says, "In every difficult situation, lays a great opportunity." And you know, if you look at where we're at in the fur market, the NAFA collapse. Um, we're in a tough time. Um, it's it's not like it was 2013 where we had a lot of forty dollar coon. Things were flying off the shelf. Uh, 2019 right now is a tough year in the fur market. There's some uncertain uncertainty. How is the industry going to come out on the other side of this NAFTA deal? Um, it's it, it's it's a little bit challenging, I think, in the in the whole market. However, I also feel like there's probably a teenage kid that's a trapper that um, has the resilience and the intelligence and the drive to start today and build the next Minnesota trap line or F and T or their own thing that's even bigger. You know that that kid exists. We probably don't know their name right now, but in five years, I bet we do. And in ten years, we're going to say, "Holy cow! Look at this! Look at this person! Look what they built!" I'm, I, I, I believe 100 percent that it's possible for sure. It's interesting. You, you also said, you know, with the technology, it's easier, in your opinion, today than it was 25 years ago when you're driving around to conventions. That makes me think that there's a, an online influencer, Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V, and he talks about that a lot. How you know, people complain about how hard things are, you know, nowadays. And he says, you know, think if your if your grandfather heard you say that, he would slap you because, you know, if if, <laughs> if you had to yeah. if if for him to go make a living, he had to go show up somewhere, get a job, do some work somewhere. He said, you can go on your phone right now and sell stuff without ever leaving your room, and you know, and and make money just like that. And I think that's such a you know, it's, it takes that perspective shift to really realize, you know, how good we have it sometimes. Yeah, exactly. And you look at, like, like eBay and Amazon, for example. Um, neither one of them, I, I, when I started in business, I knew nothing of either one of those websites. And now, you know, I, that a person could start a business today and have sales immediately because you could get on eBay, you could get on Amazon and reach trappers right now um, within minutes basically whereas in 1995 it took months to reach new customers uh, it was and it was costly so there's definitely I mean the opportunity and, and yeah you're a hundred percent right you know people that complain about things being difficult I probably um, you know they're probably setting their own hurdle uh, towards success they're, or they're, they're building themselves a, a wall between the potential for success because everything's difficult and you know what what's difficult for, for me may not be difficult for you or the next person but we all have difficulties and, and, and I think in business there's extra difficulties because um, you know, if you fail, you may not be able to pay for your truck or your house. Um, so there's a risk there too. Um, so I, 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 I definitely, I, you know, that analogy is really perfect because like, I never heard my grandpa say something was hard. Um, my, my grandpa passed away in 2016 and, and, you know, listening to some of his stories, you know, he could remember when the first car came into his county. Hmm. So, I mean, imagine what kind of opportunity that brought in his era when a vehicle showed up and we didn't have to ride a horse anymore. You know, sure. it's, just, it's Things always evolve, I guess, and, and what's difficult to one generation is not difficult to the next. But there's some common threads and hard work and perseverance and being resilient, whether you were in the 1600s coming to America or right now today. It's those same principles that that get you towards success, I think. So that that brings up something else that just just in thinking about you saying that, what would what would you say has been, I guess the best way I don't know the best way to say it, but 
you know, a, a key to the success of, of Kyle Cox as a, a trapper, but this then also as uh, Kyle Cox as a businessman over the past 25 years. What is there? Is there one thing that comes to mind that that you know has really helped you, or that you that you can look back and say, you know, that that quality or that that action or something like that? Um, kind of. I would say, um, I. I I'll answer that question with a story. When I first went to, to New Mexico, um, I got my cargo trailer ready. And and at that time, I was really into music, and, and I was reading a guitar magazine. And, and in the, the guitarist from Allison Chains, Jerry Cantrell, he had a quote. And, and in the article, he was talking about releasing his first solo album and how he mortgaged his house and took huge risks to do it. And the quote was, you know, if you're not a little bit scared about what you're doing or taking a chance, basically, if you're not taking a chance, if you're not a little bit scared about what you're doing, you're just chasing your tail. Huh. And I cut that out of that magazine and I, I taped it on the wall of a trailer. And and I could relate to that. And I think, I think there was my drive to, 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 you know, overcome challenges and take risks in business came from a couple of things. First, I didn't want to have a regular job, and I was always paranoid that I maybe would have to get one. So, <laughs> so I would say that that I used that as motivation, and I, I always kind of, at times, you know, you, you, you look at, like, you know, should I be... I'm going to take a risk here. I'm going to buy a pallet of these traps. You know, I, I don't know if I can afford it, but it feels right. And I need to try it because I'm, you know, I got this potential deal on the horizon that I could use this inventory to fill that order. Um, so that every time there's, there's those risks that, you know, when you, when you, in business, you come to a decision. And I've always thought about that. Like, I generally say, well, I'm going to try it because if I don't, I am just chasing my tail, basically. And I think through the course of the years, there's there's these decisions and 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 you know forks in the road that you come to. And I think that has maybe been always the um, the thing when I took risks and they worked out, I felt successful. And I'm not talking risks like mortgage your house and go buy a bunch of semi-loaded traps thinking you might sell. <laughs> That's foolish. That, I'm saying taking risks by, by you know, maybe mailing extra catalogs. Um, you know, I'm going to go to an extra convention this year. That's further away than I've been in the past. Early on, things like that. And I mean, nowadays I, I, I maybe. Um, you know, I, I look at things different, but I still, that quote has always stuck with me because I could relate to it at the time. Um, and and I also, I also, one of the other keys that whether I was, you know, just getting started in my state hopping, trapping Iowa or doing things, I quickly learned that if I don't worry about what other people are doing and just focus on me and my business and the things I can control, it's easier to get to where you feel successful or that you make better decisions. Because as soon as you start worrying about what other people are doing, what other people might say or what, you know, and I'm not talking about customer feedback. I'm talking about competition sure. in business, basically. Um, you know, I, we do definitely listen to customers, but, but sometimes if, if early on, like going back to your other question, the people that that were critical of me at 15 or 16, I quickly learned that you have to tune that stuff out and just focus on what you can control. And, you know, over time, um, then it's easier to to kind of focus on, on, on making the right decisions because you're only worrying about the things you could control. And I think that when I figured that out, and it was probably pretty early on when I figured that out, that that, that made it easier for me to just focus and and you know there's been times in my life that I probably was really hyper focused on business and missed out on other things um, that I, I could have done that probably would have made me uh, maybe jump started things a little quicker but I was so focused on on business um, on my own business that I, I 
I kind of had blinders on at different times, and you know that 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 probably was the right thing to do because it just kept me focused on on what I needed to do. Um, so maybe that that's probably a long-winded answer to your question, <laughs> but yeah. but I would I would say that that's you know to to kind of pinpoint it. I always would go back to that quote, and I still think about it. Um, that if you're not taking, if you're not trying something new or taking a risk, you're just chasing your tail. Uh, that that kind of always stuck with me. Hmm. That's that's pretty good. So I guess kind of getting getting back to your trapping as you've as you come up through the years and you've you've t- taken various trips to different states and things. Have you ever taken? instruction whether that be you know specific you know paid for instruction or just got a chance to trap with some you know one of your mentors or something like that oh yeah I, early on i i uh, this is something jeremiah and i talked about on his podcast i had a guy it would have been like 97 i got out of high school i went to iowa that trip was a huge flop uh I, to make a long story short i didn't know what i was doing I thought I could just run over there and catch 400 coon like everybody else. I was too young. I didn't have the knowledge to or a system in place to be able to do that. So after that year, I really was like seeking out. I was hyper-focused on trapping coon in Iowa. And the ulterior motive there was I felt like if I had some big coon catch pictures, I would be able to sell more bait and lure, which is true to a degree. Sure. Um, but it's not the sole key ingredient of selling a lot of lure and bait. However, at that time, I had a guy um, who is is well-known in trapping. He said, you should come ride with me um, on my trap line. You know, and I, I thought about it. Like, I thought he was just offering for me to come ride with him, and he would kind of show me his system and stuff. And I thought, yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. And the next thing he said was, well, it's, I normally charge 500 a day or whatever it was, but if you come for two days, it would be 400 And I thought, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> for $800, I'll just put the money in gas and scout heavier. That was my immediate thought. And so I never actually took online instruction, but through the course of my career, I have had different people that I rode with on their trap line. Um, there's a guy here in Illinois, Henry Clark, who... Uh, he caught a lot of coon. He's since passed away. Henry took me for a day scouting on his trap line, and that really helped a lot. Um, later on, I was able to spend time trapping with Dave Pluger, who Dave is is one of the premier coon producers in the in the country and has been for decades. He taught me a tremendous amount about coon, um, and also I give Dave all the credit for teaching me how to catch a beaver in a foothold. <laughs> um, and then. That let in other people. I spent time with Jackie Malone um, in Alabama, and that really, uh, I, I was fairly accomplished. I felt like I had a lot of confidence when I trapped with Jackie, but but Jackie was always one of my, my heroes and, and mentors. I always loved his articles, so getting to trap with him, um, I felt like I accomplished something in myself. I treasure those memories. Um, in New Mexico, Wayne Derrick, he really took me under his wing and I spent a lot of hours in the truck with him. And uh, Wayne's just got a wicked sense of humor. And in, in between laughing, um, taught me a tremendous amount, too. Um, just a lot of things uh, clicked when I was riding with him. I'm sure I'm leaving a bunch of people out, but, but those are the people that come to mind that I, I – uh, another guy, a guy, a friend – that I became friends with in Indiana, Tom Warlock. I rode with him, um, and he helped a lot with picking out coyote locations. Um, so I, I definitely was fortunate that, especially when you're you know, 17, 18, 19 years old, a lot of the people that, that I got to know, they were quick to, to want to share their knowledge. Um, so that would probably be an advantage to being young and starting out in this business is, is you know a lot of people when they see essentially a teenager that has a lot of drive, they're real willing to to help or or you know point you in the right direction more or less. Sure, yeah, that's one thing. And talking about your you know being at conventions and being young and all, one thing that I've seen, I haven't seen it so much. I've heard and read stories, you know, about fur buyers, 
you know, that would people, adults that look back on when they sold fur as a kid and, you know, realize that, that the fur buyer was probably paying him more than he should have, but, you know, encouraging yeah. and, and uh, you know, trying to keep that drive in him going so that, you know, I guess long term that fur buyer may could buy from him for 30 years or something, you know, but I, I, right. I didn't live through the, the fur boom when, you know, folks talk about how everybody was so secretive, but, you know, since I've gotten into trapping and uh, everybody's been, all the people that I've encountered have just been so open and willing, especially if you're a younger person interested to, to show you what they can and try to get you started any way they can, and I really appreciate that about the industry. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. And, you know, one other thing I leave out is I did have an advantage. Like, on my, on my, on my mom's side of the family, my grandpa, her her dad trapped when he was a kid. He passed away before I was born. On my dad's side of the family, uh, my, Kellen and I would be fourth-generation trappers, and we have uncles and great-uncles, cousins, that all trapped. Um, so from that aspect, I did... I, I did have a, a foundation there too, um, as far as just trapping was kind of part of the family heritage. Sure. Um, so that maybe maybe gave me a, a little bit of an advantage that you know some people that you know so many trappers that I talked to, you know their family hunted or or uh, you know they they had a basic introduction to the outdoors, but nobody in the family trapped, um, and I. I think that's it's kind of fascinating, but I think nowadays especially, there's a lot of people that are interested in bow hunting, may come across your podcast on YouTube and say, hey, this sounds kind of cool. I see coyotes from my tree stand. I want to try to trap. And I think that's one thing that's um, that's great about where where we are nowadays is is that person, they can while they're sitting in their tree stand, they can get on their phone and start learning about how to catch a coyote. Um, so I think from that standpoint, you know, getting people involved in trapping um, is easier now than it was, you know, 15, 20 years ago when it was harder to get information. And especially like in the fur boom days of, say, the late 70s, early 80s, it was even harder to get information then because, um, people were secretive, not to mention the means of getting the information was costly. Right. Hmm. So, looking back, circling all the way around to, to looking back, would you have, knowing what you know now, would you have taken that instruction from that guy? No. <laughs> no way. Good enough. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and and only because I I would say and and I'm not in, in instruction. How do I word this? Um, taking instruction now, I think, is a little bit different um, because there's a lot of people offering instruction that the instruction is going to be geared towards the person that is wanting to take it, whether they're a beginner or an experienced trapper. And I also think that, that you know, a, a lot of the people that do instruction now, if you pay them for instruction, you're going to have a avenue to get questions answered and kind of further the relationship there. And I think that's really valuable now. Sure. Whereas where I was in 1998, paying that $800 was not. I don't think. If, I don't think if I had spent that $800 then, it wouldn't be the same as if you spent the $800 now for what you would actually get out of it. Yes. And especially like, you know, it depends too on the animal. If 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 you spent money to let's say ride around with Craig O'Gorman for a couple of days you're going to get your money's worth out of that experience. You're going to walk away with new thoughts on how to catch a coyote. When we're talking about raccoon, we're talking about an animal that will break in your house and live in your attic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that you need to spend that money on on how to catch a, rac how to catch a raccoon. The system is a little more simpler. When we start talking about coyotes, even beer, 
um, we're dealing with an animal that requires a little more skill to catch and especially to produce in any quantity. So I, I would say for me, I have no regrets about, about not paying that money for the instruction. But for a person that is in that situation now, depending on the animal they wanted to target, I would say spending the money to take online instructions from somebody is probably going to be a, a, a money well spent. Um, and I think there's a trend. There's, there's, um, you know, if you if you look through a traveling magazine or or spend a little time, there's a lot of people offering offering instructions now that you could really shave 10 or 15 years off your learning curve. And I think that's something that you have to analyze that, you know, if you could pay um, a few hundred dollars and jump ahead 10 years in your coyote trapping, it is money well spent, especially with coyotes uh, selling as well as they are now. Sure, yeah, absolutely. That's the, that's the, I guess the, what you got to weigh is, do you, do you want to put the time in and spend that, 10 years learning or or uh you know spend the money and and get a get a jump that's one thing that i I wished i would have realized earlier on is uh i was i guess i haven't been over the last i don't know 10 years or so i haven't been as open-minded about different things as i've gotten in the last three or four and uh just just haven't realized that and especially listening to some of the the you know name the bigger names in the industry and and you know most of them have taken instruction from from people like O'Gorman and and things like that and it just the the impact that that can have on you long term I think is definitely worthwhile yeah yeah I, and I'm I look back to the to uh, on different things and I and I, I maybe was was also I didn't have the money to spend that was part of it sure um you know for somebody that works another job and can save it's you know if you're if somebody say 30 35 years old they've got a career they can take a weekend and spend the money when i was 17 18 years old 800 dollars was a huge wealth of money and so i needed to spend that money on traps and on gas to actually go trapping I didn't have the money to really afford the instruction at that time either. Um, so that would be, you know, that's that's something that I was, I was maybe at a, a little bit of a disadvantage. But you know, anytime you can do anything that's going to 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 bring to further your skills to where you can can shave years off your learning curve, I mean, that's a, a good investment for sure. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, looking, listening to to some of your other experiences and your your moving around, your state hopping, you've trapped in in Mississippi and Alabama. How how has that been different, or or has it is ha, was that really a, a big difference from you know Midwest trapping, or what was what was that like the learning curve and all there. <laughs> Well, first off, I, I've made a lot of friends over the course course of time um, in Mississippi and, and Alabama and in the southeast, and it is the hardest place there's to trap. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna this is uh, this is another thing, but but all y'all's weather is so much working against you there <laughs> than anywhere else. Yeah, and and like I know you just got back from from from. Texas, and I was watching some of your videos, and it seems the rain followed you there even, but, yeah. but you know, trapping in New Mexico, it's like trapping in a sandbox. Um, never rain, it's dry. In the Midwest, sure, we get some rain, but not to the same degree as in Mississippi or Alabama, where it rains, and you literally can't drive off the highway. Um, so there's it's the cha- most challenging, especially predator trapping. Um, it's the most challenging. The southeast is the most challenging place to trap predators because you're always fighting the rain. Um, and I, 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 when I, I, this is just a side a sideline. 
when I first went to Mississippi, it was uh, the winter of, of 99 into 2000, Dave Fluger and I went. And uh, the guy that managed Catfish Farmer was stayed. We kind of got to know him. He showed us around a lot. Super nice guy. He was real. He was real knowledgeable. He had actually trapped a little bit. So, so he would take us to places like, hey, there's beaver here. You know, there's uh, I seen otter cross over. You know, out of the river into the fish pond. He was a huge uh, asset. And we were having this similar conversation about about weather and how that particular year it was a drought in Mississippi. We trapped like 31 days. I think it rained one day. Hmm. And I remember talking with Greg one afternoon when we skinned, and he said, oh, y'all. And I stopped. I'm like, what? what? And, and, I, and I can't remember the context of the sentence. It was something about, you know, this, you know, all, all y'all's roads up there, are they, you know, can you drive on them when it rains? And I was like, what, all, all, what are you saying, Greg? <laughs> and he's, all, all y'all. And then he, he had to break it down. And I got a kick. I, I, uh, uh, in the end of one of your videos, he said, I appreciate all y'all listening. And uh, <laughs> I just, I was reminded of that. It's like, yep, that's, that I, I got smart. And I think that was for me, like when I, I had trapped, my first state hopping was to Iowa. But the difference between Iowa and Illinois is just which side of the Mississippi River you're on. Everything looks the same, the weather's the same, the animals are the same, the people are the same. We got the same gas stations. But when you go, especially at 19 or, or 20 years old and going from Illinois to Mississippi, everything's different. There's cotton fields, there's catfish farms, um, you know, talking to Greg. Uh, and I mean, I had, um, I had, I was used to a Southern accent. Um, we had uh, a guy my dad worked with. He had a southern accent. So I understood a little bit that I, when I went to Mississippi, I talk, I was the one talking funny now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, there was a lot of memories, you know, just just the uh, a little bit of the cultural difference. And, and that's, you know, when you go different places in the country, there's always new things to experience. And so that's always, to me, been exciting. Um, but the biggest thing was, you know, that first year being in Mississippi was a drought, and we got and we were spoiled. And I remember Greg saying, he's like, if you all come back next year, you know, don't expect it to be like this. Well, the next year, Kellen and I went, and we had, you know, 90-mile-an-hour straight-line winds. It rained. You know, we were there for, like, 27 checks. I think it rained 20 of those days. <laughs> and, I mean, just... It was like, wow, this is what Mrs. This is what Greg was talking about, and I think that forces you to really, you know, uh, especially when you're a long ways from home and you're trying to make the trip pay for itself or even make a profit. It forces you to be real creative, quick, and also adapt quickly. And I, I mean, when I look back on on Mississippi. It, I trapped Alabama. I trapped Mississippi five t five different years. Um, or wait, what's it? One, two. No, I trapped Mississippi four years, and then uh, went to Alabama years after, just two different years. And so when I went to Alabama, I, I knew what I was getting into by then. Um, and I was also I was going to be with Jackie, who, who who Jackie knew the area and knew where we were going. So I didn't have as much risk going to Alabama as I did in those early, early years going to Mississippi. But um, I, I think trapping in the South, especially for somebody that doesn't live there, um, you really – it makes you a much better trapper because – Mother Nature, you know, clenches her fist and hits you a little bit harder in the southeast <laughs> than anywhere else I've ever trapped. <laughs> yeah, I, I go back and forth with the with the northern trapper from time to time because, you know, we'll be 80 degrees or six, 70 degrees in January setting traps, and they're fighting ice and snow and all. But uh, I, I guess at least when everything's frozen, everything's frozen, and you can kind of deal with it. But with here, you... you We'll be 70 degrees one day, we'll be 30 degrees the next day, and then get five inches of rain over the next three days. So, Yeah, yeah. 
when that's just it, you know, in, in the in the in the Midwest or, or Northeast, it freezes, and once it freezes, you know, you can drive on any pit cornfield pretty much. You you can access things sometimes easier after it freezes and stays frozen. But yeah, when you're dealing with the ups and downs and the rain, I mean, it just you you really um, you, you're really at a disadvantage. Um, sometimes before you even leave the leave the house in the morning <laughs> yeah that's right that's one of the things that i've over the last few years really tried to focus on is you to have the best your best opportunities you got to keep your traps working all the time and so how can mm-hmm. you you know how can you set those traps looking at like mark zagger's pipe dream set and all you know of how can you how can you set to make sure not just to do it like everybody else does it, but to make sure that that trap stays operational, whether you do get three inches of rain or because as long as that trap's working, or that trap you know doesn't get washed out, then then your odds of, of catching something are, are the best. So yeah, yep. You gotta you gotta work with what you got, I guess. Yeah, absolutely, and, and you know, and that's just it. So someone, it's most of the like revelations in this industry were things people came up with out of necessity you know i it's not like mark zagger just sat around and dreamed about you know how can i catch a kite with a pvc pipe he came up with that because of a situation he was faced with um and and that's kind of you know to the credit of trapping as a whole is you know most of the great ideas that come about have come about out of necessity uh, because of what we're faced with dealing with mother nature and whatever, you know, wherever you trap, whether it's Arizona, Maine, Georgia, to Washington state, you're going to be faced with mother nature is going to throw floods or, or severe snowstorms or rain. There's going to be something that you're always dealing with. And I think, you know, that's where trappers get creative and, and a lot of the best ideas come from is, you know, we're, trying to come up with something that we can combat mother nature's curveballs more or less right so talking about tactics and on the trap line uh, usage you, you mentioned to me before that you bait and lure heavy so how much how much bait and lure do you typically use at a at a set um like for for coyotes yeah yeah for coyotes sorry um <clears throat> It varies, and and I'll be the first person. The past ten years, I have not really trapped coyotes that extensively like I I did. Um, you know, the peak of my coyote coyote trapping came from about uh, 03 to 06, and that window there. That's when I really hyper focused on coyotes and and fox, both predators, I would say, and trapped from Mississippi, Maine, Maryland, Illinois, New Mexico. And I, I have always tried not to focus too much on the minor things. And to me, you know, I, I, I've read a lot and, and, you know, as I kind of gained experience predator trapping, you know, some people oh, don't use a lot of lure, you'll scare them off. Yet I would see where a deer ate on a dead, or I, then I, you know, they'd say don't use a lot of lure, you'll scare them off. Yet I would see where a coyote eat on a dead deer carcass, a rotten, half rotten dead deer carcass. And I'm thinking, well, wait a second. You know, whether I use a, a teaspoon or a tablespoon or, or a, a, stick dipped, a stick dipped in my lure, yet over here we got this coyote eating on a, on a whole dead deer carcass that stinks. You know, I, it started to kind of click with me that I, I didn't, I never really paid a lot of attention to it. Um, you know, generally, uh, like bait, I would, I would, I started it to where I would carry a spoon at times just because it made it easier to get the bait out. Yeah. Other times, uh, you know, a liquid lure, I generally just pour right out of the bottle into the dirt. Um, sometimes I would, uh, I would, you know, dip a stick in whatever is convenient. I never have really felt, um, that it's totally critical. Um, other than in the southeast when it's going to rain a real lot, um, I generally lean towards lures that are thicker, that are going to hold up better to the rain. Um, 
and generally would use a little bit more. Um, a lot of times, like trapping in the Midwest, if a lot of lures, if it's if it freeze temperature to me didn't really affect how much lure I would use because a lot of lures are somewhat antifreeze. If they've got glycerin in them or, or preserved with salt, you know whether the temperature is is 65 degrees or if it drops down to below freezing, the lure is not really going to freeze. It's probably going to have the same odor profile. Uh, so temperature to me never really affected how much I used other than rain. Um, and like we had briefly talked in the email, it, like we have a drier climate, um, you know, I, I would say that, that in some instances it may be better to use a little bit more lure depending on the base or, or bait, depending on the base and what it is. When you're trapping in a really dry, arid climate like West Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, the southern Rockies, I would say it's probably smart to, you know, if you're if you're going, a person that's, that lives there, you know, they're, they're accustomed to doing things and they figure out what works and just stick with it. But if you're, if you're from another part of the country and you're going to trap a more arid desert region, I would say you're probably going to find that you're better off to, to, to use a little bit more urine, a little bit more bait, or a little bit more lure than you're used to, especially certain, certain smells like, like a, a, a urine that is going to evaporate quicker than, say, a lure bait that's formulated with glycerin or something that's going to hold the smell better or, uh, say, a, a lure that has skunk essence in it that's a very volatile smell. If you're going to use that in a dry or arid climate, the smell is going to dissipate quicker. So I would say it'd be wise to, to use a little bit, to, to, to use those certain attractors a little bit, apply a little bit more in those regions. Um, and But maybe we're probably maybe getting a little bit too technical, but I would say that, it, that there is some difference when I've trapped different places maybe there, there is some differences in, you know, how long the lure would last at a set. Yeah, no, that's a, that's exactly what I was going for. Just, you know, everybody's got their, their different, that's one of the things that I've been reading about in, in hoof beats of a wolfer and, and different things, just kind of keying in on the, the different presentations and, and uh, different sets and, and things like that. So I like getting getting other perspectives. Yeah, I think the one thing I would say when it comes to especially coyotes, um, to to not fall into a rut, always try to try to incorporate some different looking sets. Um, I know for me that different looking set, I always my brother would always laugh at me because like when we trapped together, he generally would make flat sets and I would make a double dirt hole. That was my go to. I don't know why. I just I always liked digging that double dirt hole and I think part of it was because having two holes I felt like I could control where the coyote was going to step right now that's coyotes I think we we almost have to have a different conversation about coyotes than any other animal we could trap in North America um, because not to say that they're smarter but I think they're a little bit more fickle and I think you always have to kind of be changing presentation smell um, you know, to, to, to kind of keep catching coyotes in a certain place, um, even sometimes throughout the season or from one season to the next, they're the only animal we trap that I think you can actually train. <laughs> so I do think, you know, being, being progressive and, 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 and maybe incorporating new smells and sets every season is, is important, um, because it, it, you know, the coyote that gets used to seeing a certain smell, you know, maybe he's been with another coyote that you caught and that other coyote stood there and it's like, well, you know, why are you not leaving? And then next time he comes through that field, he maybe smells blood and his buddy's not there anymore. You know, that coyote may say, hey, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sniff that hole that smelled that way anymore because something happened when my buddy did. Uh, maybe that's giving a coyote too much credit, but I firmly believe that that's that that kind of stuff happens um when especially when you trap you know most trappers trap the same farm year after year after year um that you know you, you, you always got to be looking at at you know 
adding some different looks to your sets, some different smells, so that you're you're catching some of them coyotes that may have gotten accustomed to your to your favorite go-to type sets. Yeah, that was one thing that I picked up in hoofbeats of a wolf or two is, is like you say, a lot of us are trapping at least some of the same ground every year, and we don't really think about after we pull you know pull our traps, but that bait and lure is still down that hole or still under that rock. And there's coyotes mm-hmm. for the next month that are coming by smelling that. Uh, so, you know, it may not hold the same attraction because they've already really, uh, they've already checked it out and seen that there was nothing else there. So, Right. Yep, yep. And that's, yeah, that's exactly right. You know, that, and I mean, Hope Beats is, is, is a book that I think every, anybody that has any interest in coyote trapping should read Hope Beats of a Wolf or, um, it's definitely, uh, a fascinating book because uh, Craig is so in tune with the history of coyote trapping um, that it's it's really fascinating to kind of look back. Um, and then in Hoofbeats, he he references the clever coyote by Stanley Young, and um, I, I I I actually took the first trip I made to New Mexico. I brought the clever coyote with me, and in the evenings when I was done skiing, it get dark. I was in the trailer. Um, camped out. I didn't have much else to do, so I would just reread that book over and over and over again. And it's kind of fascinating how, if you look back, you know, in the Stanley Young book, um, he's talking about about coyote trapping like in the 19 teens and 20s a lot. You know, that far back. And if you look at where we're at, like 100 years later, so much has changed. But then, in one respect, nothing's really changed. And I think there's so much that can be learned from looking back at the history of, of coyote trapping and coyote control as a whole. It's, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So let's go from looking back to looking forward as you've been in the industry for, you know, in the heart of the industry for 25 years. What do you see? I mean, there's been a lot of activity. Um, this, this past year, at least to me, has seemed – a lot more activity from the anti so far as trying to legislate against trapping and and different aspects and then with NAFA what do you see as the you know the future of trapping going going forward I, I, I feel I feel real positive I feel very optimistic um, there's a few challenges and, and you know the the, the NAFA deal I, I just listened I know you had Guy Grunwald on here a few weeks ago and and Guy is somebody I talk to a lot. I, I, I think he is so interesting to talk to as far as how in tune he is with the fur market, what's happening in the global scale of things. Um, and Guy is somebody that I've, I've talked to a lot. You know, basically going back to it probably in about July um, is when the NAFA stuff, it wasn't made public, but but – Everybody kind of knew NAFA is going downhill fast. They're not going to come out of this unless a miracle happens. Um, and one of my immediate thoughts when first, when it was first kind of confirmed later last summer that NAFA was probably going to end up in a bankruptcy, bankruptcy at some point, is that the funding of so many organizations, um, the International Fur Federation, um, you know, Fur Commission USA, uh, so many global type trade organizations in the fur industry would get funding from NAFA. So now, what happens when this changes? Um, I think short term, it's a bit of a struggle because you know things got to be restructured. Long term, I think it will all work out great. You know, Sagafers is going to take over the ranch mink, and I, I just read an email where they're going to continue to collect money for the various organizations, basically the same way NAFA was. So to me, that's a huge relief, you know, that the money is still going to go into our various trade organizations. Um, that is something that that was my first immediate worry with the whole NAFA deal is, you know, the how are we going to get the funding? Um, which leads into the legislative aspect of things. You know, the, the animal rights movement as a whole, um, a, lot of, a lot of trappers are misinformed about it. And, and 
people right away. You know, a lot of trappers get kind of redneck, like, oh, them people, you know, they don't get it. Nah, they want to argue and confront animal rights, the animal rights movement, which is it's understandable, but it's it's not something we need to confront head on. We need to be progressive. Um, we need to we need to to focus on our own advocacy. And uh, going back to what I said earlier in business, we can't worry about what other people are doing. And no different with with um, trapping. We can't worry about what the animal rights movement is doing. We have to focus on what we are doing to promote ourselves and advocate advocate for trapping. Um, which naturally, and you look at the in the past year, um, there's been a lot of legislation, a lot of legislative issues. You know, the New York City Hawaii fur bans um, are the two big ones I think that that you know get our attention. And of course, there's always there's it seems like every year there's different states experience different legislative issues. Um, the one thing that I always kind of kind of think about is is something that I it's been 20 years ago that it was explained to me by a guy that it, who who was an he had worked for HSUS and had some falling out and then he turned his went three th or went 180 and started advocating for consumptive use and this guy told me he said animal rights the animal rights movement is not about animals and I was like what do you mean <laughs> he said it's about raising money hmm. and when you look at it from that perspective it kind of changes things um first off if all the whales are saved if there's no more trapping um if there's no more fur farming um if nobody keeps a chicken in a cage anymore if all those things stop how is animal rights why do why does an animal rights organization need to exist at that point because they would have accomplished everything they wanted so I don't believe that that animal rights organizations really care about animals they care about money yeah. so they need ways to raise money um, and they're very good at raising money I mean if you it's it's no secret how much money HSUS is able to raise um, or PETA they have tons of money because they pull at the heartstrings of the general public um, to raise money, and they don't care if they're being factual or not. Um, you know, one of the worst things to happen to our industry in recent times was the video of a China fur farmer. Fur farmer, I think he skinned a blue fox alive, and that video was hugely detrimental to the fur industry. Come to find out. Um, it has since been proven that an animal rights group paid that Chinese fur farmer to skin that fox. That's huh. not a practice that exists. But the animal rights people could could see the monetary value of producing that type of video to raise money. They could they could care less. There is no trapper, no fur farmer, uh, no hunter that would ever dream of skinning an animal alive. Right. But an animal rights person would scheme that up in their head to raise money. So that video in itself proves they're not about animals. They're about raising money. So when we look at it from that perspective, we will, is, is for, from here on out, I never see the animal rights movement going away. No different than I never see trapping or, or, hunting or fur farming I never see those things going away but you know as passionate as we are for our outdoor pursuits those people are against them and that's just the nature of humanity I think it's always been that way it'll always be that moving ahead and the best way that we can combat that or the best way we can win is to advocate um, you know we have science we have wildlife management we have the truth on our side it's just a matter of getting that out there to the public and i do think that society is changing as we see a trend towards um you know people are becoming more conscious of 
a carbon footprint. Um, they want things organic. They want things green. And as we see this change in society, you know, trapping fur is something that is organic by nature. Um, and I, I think there's a trend that is in our favor um, when you look at just the TV shows that have kind of romanticized trapping, like Mountain Men, for example, that is hugely, um, it, um, it's, a, it's, it's a great thing for trappers because it's reaching the public and showing that we are, we are vital, we are real, we're not outdated. In modern society, we have a place and we're still trapping and we're doing a great, providing a great service. Um, and and I, I think, I guess I maybe got a little long-winded about that question, but it's something that I, I, I feel like I, I think about fairly often and, and, you know, try to, I definitely feel, you know, I, I try to support the different organizations as much as I possibly can um, because there's a, a lot of, good people doing a lot of good things for trapping and I I think that's that's you know that's the future is is to be supportive you know donate some time trapper education um, is important but public education is the real key here um, and so anytime we can portray and that's something to you know when I, I don't you can never be afraid to say I'm a trapper because a lot of people will not ever a, a, a person that's just a member of the general public that never thinks about animals one way or the other um, probably li living in a city uh, or a bigger area you know if that person encounters one trapper it may be the only trapper that they ever encounter in their life or have encountered so we want to make sure we're portraying an image that's positive so that if that person ever is forced with a ballot initiative or has to vote that they can say, oh, I, re I remember, hey, I met that Chris. He was a trapper. He was a good guy. Trappers must all be good people, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote in favor of that good guy. I think that's important, the image we, we portray. Um, so, and, and, and I think, you know, we've had a lot of things go our way. we still got a lot of challenges, and, and there will be more coming, I'm sure, but I, I feel confident that, that you know, that the fur industry as a whole works together on a global front that you know we can we can be proactive and we can we can win and that's that's important i guess yeah I, the one thing talking about education the one thing that and i've seen it even in the last week as i was out in texas and you know some family um was gathering for for thanksgiving and if we had a pile of fur that was the one of the good days we had trapping we had a beaver and a bobcat and a coyote and we had all this stuff in the back of the truck and um there was probably 10 or 15 kids it was a bunch of kids and their parents and uh it was unintentional but uh we just happened to be at the same place at the same time and the dad peeked over the over the bed of the truck and saw all the animals and man he got really excited and he said can we show the kids and we dropped the tailgate and I mean, even, you know, the parents, the moms, the, the kids, I mean, they were all touching the furs and, and asking about all different questions. I mean, I feel like in general, people, we've got something with the, with the animals that we catch and, and what we do that people can get really interested in. And, you know, the, those kids had never seen a beaver or a bobcat or much less been able to touch one. And so, you know, taking that opportunity to spend a little time with them to show them that we're not knuckle-dragging your skull crushers you know that we're you know we, we, there's a purpose to what we're doing and we walk around with you know sh shoes and we're not running around barefoot and we're, we're real people i feel like there that uh there's people that are more receptive to that than a lot of times we think yeah i mean that that's those those little interactions and i mean to you or i being a trapper we probably never even think about it until after the fact but it's like you know, the, like you say, they, when else are they going to, when else, or where else, how often does the person have a chance to actually see a beaver up, up close and personal where they could touch it? And they're going to remember that interaction. And, and I think, I think that's important, um, you know, that that's, you know, it, it ha 
portraying our our heritage in that light to those people that's the best advocacy that we have really absolutely well kyle we're running up on a an hour here um and I don't <laughs> it feels want to... like about ten minutes. I told Jeremiah the times I've been on there. It's just like it's really enjoyable to, to kind of kind of talk, and 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 it's just nice to have a break. And I, I enjoy visiting with you. It always goes fast, and that's that's one thing that that I appreciate. You know, there's not a lot of trappers per se uh, when you're just out and about meeting people, but you can kind of always you always wind up finding another trapper somewhere where you are, and it you know it's like an instant kinship. You, never met that person from adam but all of a sudden you've got you know so many in common things that you can talk about i really appreciate (laughs) that about about the the industry and trappers as a whole so well i guess one last question for you if you what would be a a a parting piece of advice for a, a new trapper somebody that's that's been interested been wanting to get into trapping but they haven't done it yet so far as 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 getting started what would be what would be you know one one piece of advice from you run and dive in <laughs> that's the best way to learn you're going to make mistakes um you know but don't get discouraged you, you know there's there's a, so much good information if they're listening to this podcast you know they've got hours worth of good information they can go back to um you know as a reference and and don't put it off it's, there's no there's no better time to start trapping than right now today um that's I guess that would be my my best advice is just go out there and do it, um, and, and start the learning process. You won't you won't regret it. And it and and it's also something that you know, trapping has been around hundreds and hundreds of years. So many people have done it. It's not that hard. You just <laughs> got to start. <laughs> That's right. There's no time like the present, and I I I, I appreciate that 100. percent Yeah. Well, before we sign off, you said you uh, set up a coupon code for folks at Cots Bros uh, Lures. So you wanna you wanna give us the details on that? Yeah, yeah. If I I put in a coupon code today. You know, we just started in with the sponsoring the podcast, and I'm sure there's a lot of people listening that haven't ordered from us before. And if they want to give us a try, if they enter the code Pope, your last name P O P E five, they'll get five dollars off any order over twenty dollars and that code is good until december 31st on cotsbrothers.com awesome well that uh that sounds good and we will uh we'll get some people headed that way in fact i've got some i've got some bait and lure coming from you right now so uh yeah i saw that i appreciate it yeah i'm hoping to get uh hoping to get trying to kind of catch up from being gone for a couple weeks but hopefully by this weekend i'll get some get some traps back out here in georgia and see what we can catch Sounds real good. Well, Kyle, I appreciate the time, and uh, I appreciate all your your wisdom, and we'll definitely be sure to stay in touch. Sounds great. Thanks for having me, Chris.